Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and today I am back to s continuing my conversation on Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. We'll be starting with the fourth and final chapter today. And if you have followed this series, you already know that from chapter one to chapter three, Freire first describes the kind of world in which we live, how oppression works, what the purpose of education is to make us realize our full humanity, right? Then he goes on to explain the two competing modes of pedagogy, right? The top-down banking model and the problem-solving method, a problem-posing method of education. And then in chapter three, he actually gives us insights into how to develop a dialogical or dialogic curriculum and how to work with a community. In chapter four, he foregrounds the previous discussion or uses it, of course, as a tool to theorize a form of revolutionary action, right? Or a form of transformational praxis, right? And that's why he starts this chapter by referring to what he has discussed previously. But what we'll see in chapter four is kind of a theory of praxis that he articulates and that is important for us to understand. So just like the other videos, I'll first read and then come and briefly talk about it. So here we go with the first set of reading. This chapter which analyzes the theories of cultural action which develop from anti-dialogical and dialogical matrices will make frequent reference to points presented in the previous chapters, either to expand these points or to clarify new affirmations. I shall start by reaffirming that humankind as beings of the praxis differ from animals, which are beings of pure activity. Animals do not consider the world. They are immersed in it. In contrast, human beings emerge from the world, objectify it, and in so doing can understand it and transform it with their labor. Animals which do not labor live in a setting which they cannot transcend. Hence, each animal species lives in the context appropriate to it, and these contexts, while open to humans, cannot communicate among themselves. But human activity consists of action and reflection. It is praxis. It is transformation of the world. And as praxis, it requires theory to eliminate it. Human activity is theory and practice. It is reflection and action. It cannot as I stressed in chapter 2, be reduced to either verbalism or activism. Lenin's famous statement, without a revolutionary theory there can be no revolutionary movement, means that a revolution is achieved with neither verbalism nor activism, but rather with praxis, that is, with reflection and action directed at the structures to be transformed. The revolutionary effort to transform these structures radically cannot designate its leaders as its thinkers and the oppressed as mere doers. If true commitment to the people involving the transformation of the reality by which they are oppressed requires a theory of transforming action, this theory cannot fail to assign the people a fundamental role in the transformation process. The leaders cannot treat the oppressed as mere activists to be denied the opportunity of reflection and allowed merely the illusion of acting, whereas in fact they would continue to be manipulated, and in this case by the presumed foes of manipulation. The leaders do bear the responsibility for coordination and, at times, direction. But leaders who deny praxis to the oppressed thereby invalidate their own praxis. By imposing their word on others, they falsify that word and establish a contradiction between their methods and their objectives. If they are truly committed to liberation, their action and reflection cannot proceed without the action and reflection of others. So as I pointed out in the uh, beginning, 
He starts this chapter by a clear reference to what he has already discussed in the previous chapters, right? And that tells us that whatever he has theorized and put in place is going to be important in understanding this chapter, but also in developing a, a revolutionary praxis. He starts with the distinction that he had made in a previous chapter between humans and animals. Now, a lot of animal rights activists, of course, see it as a, a problematic part of Freire's discussion, but I don't see it like that because he's not comparing the two per se to prove that human beings are better. In his discussion of the thematic universe, he brings up the question of the animal versus human. And I think his reason to invoke the, this dichotomy was that the difference between animals and humans, of course, is that animals do not transform their environment or reflect on it. They cannot objectify it and think about it. Their responses to changing environments are not rational, don't involve a thinking process, but they are survivalists. So instead of transforming an environment, they relocate to an environment that suits their purpose. Whereas human beings are rational creatures capable of thought, but also capable of transforming their environment and the kind of human subjectivity that he's privileging is the kind of human subjectivity that hopes to transform the unjust conditions, alter them, and change them. So that's why I think he discusses this human-animal distinction. And that's how I read it. So he starts from that, and then he re-emphasizes what he means by praxis. Like, praxis is not just activism and not just verbalism. Like, Praxis involves two things, reflection and action. Reflection on the lived conditions in which we are or the world in which we exist, right? And then action to transform it, action to change it, right? And that then requires a theory. And that's why he quotes Lenin from What Should Be Done. I think that's the title of the essay. That, um, that any revolutionary act cannot just be mere activism or just mere verbalism. You can't just win it through slogans or can't just win it before without unreflected action. So both reflection and action must come together to achieve transformative change. And then the last part of the passages that I read are about, uh, they are cautionary. We have encountered them before, I think, in chapter two, when he, or three, when he discusses the dialogical nature uh, of any revolutionary movement, right? Where he's now again reminding us that no revolu revolutionary transformation can be accomplished simply by the re leaders or by the people if they are not reflecting. So people must be constant part of a transformative revolutionary act. But they cannot just be tools, they cannot just be doers. And the leaders become the thinkers. No, then that doesn't fit the paradigm that he has established. The people must be thinking participants of this revolutionary act. That's why he has devised the dialogical mode of teaching, so that they can become that. And the leaders, on the other hand, must also not be just the speakers. Right? They must also reflect, but also act. So what he is encouraging towards the end of these passages, the leaders do bear the responsibility. They can organize, they can you know, decide on how to do things with the consent of the people. But if they are truly committed to liberation, their action and reflection cannot proceed without the action and reflection of others. So in any kind of revolutionary movement to change or transform the world, the unjust world, it cannot just be decided by the leaders and acted upon by the people. No, people must be active participants in the decision-making process, in the thinking process, and then along with their leaders whom they themselves must have chosen to transform it. So this is where he leaves us in these paragraphs. So my idea at this point is that this chapter, the culminating chapter of the book, 
gives us a theory of praxis, a theory of revolution, which is informed by what he has discussed in the previous chapters. So that's all I have to say uh, briefly about this first video in my series on chapter 4 of Pedagogy of the Oppressed. I hope you have been reading the book and following it through the videos. I strongly recommend you to do that because videos alone, of course, cannot do the job. And I'm also, as I pointed out several times, I'm aware of the irony of this medium because what I am doing com comes across as top down, right? But that's not my purpose. My purpose is to share these ideas with you and you can willingly become the participants in this conversation by commenting in the comment section and maybe we can make it more dialogic in that sense. That's all. I hope you all are doing well. I hope you're all coping with this pandemic by taking care of yourself and others around you. Please continue to do so. I will be back with the next installment in my Freire series later sometime in the near future. Thank you so much and as always, peace and love.